This episode of The Capsule in Conversation is brought to you by Harrogate Spring Water. Famous for its waters since 1571, Harrogate is Britain's premium natural source water. Hello all, you are listening to the Capsule in Conversation podcast. I'm Natalie Anderson and today I'm joined by one of the UK's most exciting female talents, actress and writer Taj Atwell, to talk the power of trusting the process and raising hell in hull. So make yourself comfortable and get ready to join us in our conversation. Hello all, it is lovely to have you with us today. I can't wait to chat to my special guest as it's been a good few months since I last saw her and heard her wicked laugh. And now if you're a fan of Channel 4's Hallraisers, no doubt you'll know exactly what I mean. Her character Rana in the hit show laughed and loved a lot whilst navigating the joys of single life around her mothered up best friends. She's also gracing our screens as the role of FBI agent Linda Amistead in legendary Bond director Martin Campbell's memory opposite Liam Neeson and Guy Pearce, while simultaneously playing Lee in BBC's The Control Room. She is in demand, she is everywhere, and she's here. Hi, Taj. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. Now, you've moved house. So tell yes. me, that has that been stressful? It was overwhelming. Yeah. I just, I, the actual buying of the house was absolutely fine and really straightforward for me because I think I'd heard so many scare stories. So I was just, um, I knew what to look out for. Um, but then when I moved in, it was just, it just felt like chaos. I've, I've done so much renovating. I'm getting a whole new kitchen in a couple of weeks as well. And it's just, I don't even want to turn my laptop around and show you what the same <laughs> living room looks like. There's just stuff everywhere, building stuff everywhere. And that can be quite chaotic, can't it? You know, when you've, um, we did some renovations of like a decade ago now when Freddie was tiny, actually. So with a newborn baby, it was oh, so strange. No, I couldn't do it. I don't know like how, how it. they do it on Grand Designs and all those programs. Mm-hmm. It's um, But it, you have to kind of find your safe space, don't you? You know, have you managed to kind of, like in your bedroom or something create a, a, a space that feels like a bit calm yeah I mean god bless the people that had lived here before their carpet was like 20 years old and I was sleeping on a mattress on this floor until my new carpet arrived and then like once I'd ripped out that carpet and had and painted the walls and they were blue and just weird um and I actually had a bed to sleep on. That was when I started to feel like, okay, I've got one space. I was sleeping in my guest room. I did that room first. Yeah. Um, and then I started to relax ish. <laughs> <laughs> Relaxation is such an important thing, isn't it? And particularly as, you know, with our job, when you have to be so yeah. focused on things, what kind of things do you, what do you, you know, where do you go? What do you do when you need to relax? Have you got any kind of practices or products that you Yeah. Love? Well, I meditate every day. So, um, I do that. Exercise. I love exercising. Um, I box and I, I've been doing Muay Thai for a while now, which is really good fun. Oh, what's that? Muay Thai. It's um, Thai boxing. <laughs> I, I thought well, it was I a, that right. Yeah, but I thought it was um, a cocktail. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I drink my ties every week. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh gosh, no, I wish. And just, yeah, we'll go for a walk in the countryside. Really simple things, like really simple things um, please me. I don't like doing things too complicated. Nature, exercise, meditation. And oh, I go dancing a lot with my mates. I go out a lot with my friends. <laughs> You, you know, we've had this conversation before where you've said to me that um, sometimes actually the best way for you to relax is actually to go out and let your hair down with your mates and kind of yeah. dance because you love dancing so much. I do, I do. I just love it. We just love going out <laughs> and like to festivals and like raves and stuff and just, I don't know, when you're outdoors and you're under the gorgeous sky and the sun setting and it's just beautiful dance music playing and with you look around and see all your mates who've got big smiles on their faces and I just I don't know it really I just absolutely love it and um, in terms of products do you have any like go-tos that you absolutely love or mm. swear by not particularly no no not really I use a lot of magnesium um but I don't. And and do you take magnesium or do you put it on your body? I use the spray. I use the spray because oh. I get really bad period pain. So I, somebody told me that it was really good for magnesium. I mean, nothing has helped me with the pain so far, but I do use it and it helps me sleep. There'll be lots of women listening to this that probably will relate to those pains. You know, how do you oh alleviate pain? Well, I've had it. I mean, I've had it since I was 11, excruciating from the very first period. And I... 
have had every scan, every th- I have acupuncture every three weeks. I mean, it's, nothing has ever quite touched the sides. Um, I wish there was more research into it, just a bit more. I don't know because it's yeah. expensive as well with painkillers and stuff. And and so and, and they haven't said it's an endometriosis or yeah. anything like that. No, I had I had I have scans scans quite regularly and stuff, and it's just pain. I don't know. There's so many women who have who just have pain, but we don't know what the cause of it. There must be a cause of it. Um, you know, if you don't have endometriosis and you suffer with dysmenorrhea, but that must be that must be so frustrating, Taj, as well, because like again, if you can't almost give it a label, so to speak, and then mm. you know, and and be able to kind of say, actually, it's this, then. And yet it's causing you so so much discomfort. That must be really frustrating to be able to kind of get, get yourself heard really and be taken seriously rather than it just be, oh, you've just got period pain. It's a struggle because you're told to just, well, if there's no other co- cause that we know of for it, it's just, well, you've just got the pain and how, how can you best manage it? Whereas I love to look at the cause of everything. Yeah. Just in particular with me, if there's something going on internally with me, I want to know like, what is the actual root cause of this feeling? It's not you know, the feeling that's the issue, there'll be something underneath it. But with period pain, if there isn't endometriosis or, you know, the big kind of um, illnesses, I don't know what you're supposed to do other than try alternative medicines or, and it's expensive having acupuncture every few weeks, but yeah. I'll just, I will try anything. And it's like you said then, like you, like just you then saying, I'll try anything. And then that'll be with so many other women as well that'll yeah. feel like, God, you know, whether it's hot water bottles or all the, you know, whether it's painkillers or trying to eat the right things. It's so unfair that as women, we do yeah. have to go through this and it's kind of like, well, you know, get on with it. I mean, we've seen it so much recently, um, it just in the media with people that are suffering with symptoms of perimenopause or menopause, which a majority, yeah. we're all going to go through this at some point and yet it's not taken seriously enough and we're only just starting now to kind of research it and put money into the research and like you said there should be more research about it hey where's research and take it like being able to talk about it I mean there's you know I look back at myself and I imagine all the young girls as well at school and stuff like that like I could barely even go I remember oh. mom did let me take time off because it was excruciating I, I couldn't even go to school and I think you know um some schools can be so strict. They just don't quite understand what a young girl is going through. I and mean, when you're 11 anyway, you're just oh. sort of figuring yourself out and you're so young and then you have this excruciating pain to deal with. And, you know, even if you're at work and stuff, there's times where you can't get out of bed. And it's just having an open conversation about that and a bit more kind of support and awareness. I think it's brilliant that we are having more open conversations about periods in general. I mean, I remember kind of when we first started this podcast three years ago and how much the landscape's changed in general about us, the the, the use of the word and, and the fact that we are talking about it. And we, we've talked before about, you know, period poverty in schools and period shame in schools and how, you know, and even as grown women, I still do it. I walk around like pretending that I don't have tampons in my hand I'm like why am I doing that really oh, yeah no I don't I mean that I've, luckily I've gone past that now and I'm just like no I'm, I'm on period like <laughs> so I'm there and I'm in pain and a male colleague asks me are you all right and I'm like no this is what I'm going through right now I don't feel any worry or shame and I shouldn't we shouldn't feel any shame to say that we're in pain no we should we shouldn't but it is um it's a funny thing and I think we are moving in the right direction though thankfully yeah, and I, I and so. I really hope that there is more research um put into that particular area of women's health because it's like you say it's really unfair and and the fact that women are walking around feeling in so much pain it's just inf- infuriating really um moving away um kind of from the health aspect of things um work you have been so busy I mean so busy and you've just have, am I right in thinking you've just wrapped on Christmas Carol with Saran Jones yeah about a month ago about a month ago I wrapped on well, I got a bit, bit longer than that um yeah my first Christmas film I've always it was only about eight weeks before that actually I was like oh, I really want to do Christmas if there's anything that I do this year it's got to be a Christmas film and um, and I wanted to Saran was already in my energy she, a few people a few of her best friends close friends had um I'd worked with and they had mentioned her. I'm like, oh, have you ever met Saran Jones? You really remind us of a young Saran or you just, your energy reminds us of Saran. And so she was in, in my um, energy and awareness. And then, yeah, the film ended up being alongside her and she, you know, she um, is the lead and she's incredible and is everything I could have 
uh, hoped for and more. And you're playing Bobby Cratchit. Yeah, so it's a mod, it's set in a corporate world and um, I'm not sure how much I'm allowed to talk about it, but, um, and uh, Saran's character is, I suppose, would be Scrooge um, in the books and I'm her Cratchit. Yeah. <laughs> so like her PR, PA um, in, in our line of work. And so that's a really cool take on it, though, like a modern take on it. And this yeah. is for Sky. It's for Sky Movies, yeah. And it's all about kind of greed and um, overconsumption, which I suppose Christmas Carol is. And, um, yeah, it's brilliant. It's it's just absolutely fantastic. I was just so thrilled to be a part of the, the project and filming in London and, like, there was fake snow. I was like, oh, oh. this is amazing. Even though it was in, like, the, hot, it was the hottest days of the year and there was sweat dripping down our faces, it was, yeah. I remember saying to makeup, I was like, you sure you can't see the sweat on screen? <laughs> But, but and that's often the way you yeah. always have to film Christmas Shoot in July. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We've I've done it before where um we were working on another show in Scarborough and we had it was set in the sixties and we had these massive big wool capes on oh. and it was boiling and we were literally oh. like as you said fake snow and all of that and we were sweating to death. Yeah, you're there and you just that's like, I don't know for me it's a part of it. It's just all a part of it every bit. I love the early morning starts. I love waking up before the world has even risen. I love night shoots. I, I just, every part of it, I really do enjoy it. And speaking of night shoots, you know, I'll move straight across to Memory, which is a film yeah, we both we worked on. We had a <laughs> lot of night shoots on there. And and the training for that, that you, I know you absolutely loved and embraced yeah, playing Linda. You know, just again, talk me through some of the highlights of working on that that movie. Oh, it was just oh, all of it. I mean, I'd never played, you know, my character was from Dallas. It was my first foray into American movies. Um, got to work with Liam and Guy and Harold Torres and you guys and made friends for life. Um, you being one of them. And the training, I absolutely loved it. You know, I got to have training with my, my car was my FBI car was an American Dodge Charger and I'm a bit of a petrol head. And um, I just love cars. And so I got to kind of have lessons sort of racing get around on, on set because I had to actually do that I had to, on shoot days and um yeah it was amazing and Obviously. as you said you know you are a bit of a petrol head you know like if we got to take you back to being 17 and 18 and racing down country lanes it was something that you've you've always really enjoyed yeah, I mean, I don't think I was very good at it. So I, was just, I, just, I, don't think we were, I was so fearless and so was my mates. And I, the group of girls that I was with, we were all really into, we all wanted to pass our driving tests and drive cars. And so we all started when we were 17. I mean, I failed a couple of times. So I was so young. And we were just, my mate Catherine, we were just, um, um, we'd take our little courses and her course and mine and we'd just go down country lanes and pull handbrake turn. We'd teach each other how to pull a handbrake turn and, on our own. I mean, those are the days of like no power steering, so you could do that kind of stuff. I mean, <laughs> totally illegal. You totally can't do that stuff. I don't want anyone to get any ideas. But you know, it's what we did. We just did that stuff then. And so, and as you said, there's an element of a fearlessness and a fearlessness there, which I do think you bring to your work. You bring so much like fearlessness um, to it in your energy and just throw it out there and kind of go with it as a bit of a process. And, you know, you were saying before, you lo- you really love it, don't you? Like the job, the, the creation, the creativity. It's just making something. I don't know, making something or... I don't know. I really can't put my finger on it. I've really, people ask me this question all the time and I never quite know what it is, but I just, you're never being a completely another different person. You're always going to bring an element of yourself to it. But I love that. I love being able to bring light and shade of me because we all have light and shade to a character in a safe environment and, um, and create something. Do you think there's an element as well of kind of um, living out your fantasies in the sense like with Linda, you did get to drive those cars really yeah. fast and you did get to kick ass. Yeah, I mean, yeah, just bringing somebody's words to life, bringing a story to life and being around other people that also want to do that. For me, it's just electric, especially when you're with the right cast members and the people who really kind of also want to put in the same kind of work I think you just 
something really magic happens on a set and when you create something and I, I really still don't have the vocabulary for it. I think you're so right. Like for me with memory, even though I wasn't on it and I wasn't out in Bulgaria as long as you were, and you know, you were there for the whole time. It was such an incredible experience and not just on set, offset as well yeah. like we created these amazing friendships and I know you were out there hiking in the hills and you know going into the caves and getting lost and uh, having yeah. like a great yeah. time and all those other memories that you create on a set with people yeah. and those connections you just like this weird little bizarre you become like a really close-knit bizarre group of people not always you know you're not going to get on with everyone and you know that's just life um and it's it can be lonely like I was there for the whole I think it was like 17 weeks on my own for a lot of it in my hotel room or whatever and out for dinners on my own but there was a, something in that that I kind of sitting with yourself for that long in solitude there's power in that mm. and at the time you don't feel it but when you come away from it and you look back on it something transformative happens in you as a person and I and um this growth that you have and like you said you know I've got we've get to visit incredible places or yeah hiking up the mountains and it's phenomenal I've got to get to see beautiful Bulgaria and, and and you know what you're saying there with that um that period of growth I definitely felt that and like I said I wasn't there as long as you but I had that moment of I just left my yeah. family behind in the pandemic I got into that hotel room mm. and I didn't know anyone and literally had to yeah. I was on my own for those first couple of days because I was so daunting. nervous and yeah, yeah but it was still one of the most transformative periods of my life because as I've come yeah. away and as a, as a mother leaving behind my son and you know what I was like I was like oh my god yeah. my Freddie and all this and you know I was chatting to you guys and really clutched on to you as you said in this weird kind of family <laughs> unit in that hotel that we yeah, were in yeah. um but there is a real sense of growth in the silence in the being at one with yourself and having to push yourself kind of through um through challenges and barriers and in it giving you time as well to really focus on your work and the scene focus on your work immerse yourself into the culture I mean we were just we were still pretty much in the pandemic like in the thick of it all so mm. it was a really bizarre experience it was like super painful and super lonely but at the same time I just found so much so much personal strength in that time um for me you know really rising up amongst my peers you know you're working mm. alongside Hollywood elite like Liam and Guy and Monica and um it gave me confidence to know that I could do that I could spend that I mean I love my own time anyway I love being on my own and just in silence and um yeah I don't know I found an inner strength out there and and as you said then, you know, you were put in that position where you were leading um, this incredible movie, you know, with with a Bond director and Liam Neeson and, and you know, really owned it and, and really owned your own and held your own on that set. At any point, did you have any wave of nerves or think, oh my God, and, you know, how did you get through that? Every day. <laughs> <laughs> Every day I would just be like sleepless nights, like right tomorrow. I've got all the, well, you know, can I do it? Will I be able to do it? And you know, you know, staying in the, you know, doing this accent. And so I had phenomenal coaching. Actually, I was really thankful for. And um, and then once you're in it, I don't know. You're just doing such long days, seventeen hour days. Some days I was just like, you're just you, the insecurity just has to go because you're back to back to back to back to back. And I think that's what kind of um, I suppose just guided me just forced me to, to get through it. <laughs> I think as well, Martin himself as a director, you know, having all that history, working at the level that he works at, I think you once yeah. said to me, trust Martin, he won't ever make you, let you look rubbish. And and learning that trust yeah. and learning that kind of, yeah. um, he picked you and you were here. And I know he picked you specifically from another film and yeah. actually like hand picked you and said, I want her for the job, which there's an element yeah. of um, reassurance, I suppose, in that where you can then feel free to crack on and do the job. Definitely. And I think also then there was like this element of, like, I have to, he's, he's asked me to do this and I want to make sure that I deliver and I do 
um, you know, his choice was justified in choosing me. And um, there was a bit of pressure with that. And then there were days where I just thought I'd go back and beat myself up because I just thought, oh, I could have done this, could have done that. I didn't do this. And we had the time and oh, I should. And then it was actually Ray Veeran who was like, you have to trust that Martin has got the take or that Martin has got what he's he's needed from you. And he's so right <laughs> in that way. But like, I think also that comes with me. I just always want to give the best that I can. And, and if I, even if I think I've given my best I go away and I think I probably could have done more and more and I just want to give more and more and more and more and more because I want to leave everything on the table and I, I know that when I've gone back home I get, gave it everything and there wasn't one thing that I didn't that I couldn't have um more that I could have done in that movie though I, I said this to you before my mum was like you were really good Natalie but that girl <laughs> so, like my young, oh, my mum's your biggest fan and literally you know you did give it everything <laughs> and it, it's been so well received and your performance was amazing and you've you know obviously have got a huge back catalogue of work anyway but in this last year as you said you went straight from memory then into Hull Raisers which I know you've also put everything yeah. into the character of Rana who yeah. is such an incredible character and as again the yeah. show itself has been so popular but I think so much of the popularity is the truth of these women that these three incredible women who are not exactly what they should be they're kind of flipped on their head but that's truth in that that we're not all the, these stereotypes you know what I mean and particularly as Rana I know you did a lot of exploration with her going down different avenues before you arrived at yeah. the version that you have now just tell me a bit about that yeah because I mean she's obviously incredibly sexually empowered and but I didn't have the vocabulary for that originally and I just kept thinking like what well, she must have some internal pain for her to want to sleep with men on the regular like what is she looking for is there something else she's missing in her life for her want to do that and actually when I let go of that old social conditioning and I just realized it's because she enjoys sex and she, because she's a sexually empowered woman and she has a dialogue with these guys where they both just know, you know, that's what it is and they enjoy it and they're doing it for the enjoyment of it. And there's no shame around that. And once I got to that place, which wasn't easy, it took me a while to figure it out. I just constantly thought, right, I'm sexually empowered. I'm an empowered woman. I love my work I love my social life and I even my character even says I fucking love me <laughs> and I thought well how empowering you know when do you ever get to hear people say that that they actually usually it's a slight oh look at you oh look at her she loves herself and I think well good I'm glad she does because you should love yourself and I took that from her from from Rana I took that from this character and I thought well yeah you know good on her like she knows she's good at what she does and there's nothing wrong with it and and it is it was such a powerful moment and and delivered beautifully and I think there is again it's that it is that element you know self-care isn't selfish and we can put ourselves first and we can prioritize ourselves and there is absolutely nothing wrong with loving you we had a fantastic guest on a couple of years ago Griselda who was um, a leadership coach and she yeah. said she was talking about children and it's funny how we we encourage our children right up to a certain age and then we start telling them not to get ahead of themselves like oh well don't do that it's a bit big-headed don't do this and we start putting all these limitations onto children whereas actually we should just keep them loving themselves we should keep them kind of letting themselves go and have in owning their own power rather than creating this what I feel now is a really outdated um uh, as you were saying, you know, so, social conditioning of she loves herself. I'm the same as you. I'm like, yeah, good. I should hope she does. Do you know yeah. what's, what's wrong with that? Yeah, and there's obviously not, you know, you don't want to be like this ego way. It's like an internal satisfaction for who you are and always still striving to be better, a better person. You know, there's always room for improvement in me anyway. Sometimes I let myself down in situations or I'll have been, you know, and I just thought, oh, I could have handled that better or I wasn't, you know, but I don't go home and like completely, I try not to beat myself about it. I think like that was the learning curve. It was a moment that I need to sit and learn from, mm -hmm. um, apologizing when I need to apologize, but then also just having an inner calm. And I, I like, I'm not saying I do, it's still a work in progress. <laughs> 
but I'm definitely better than I was when I was in my twenties where I just had self-loathing. And it, like you said, it's being told to be smaller, smaller. I never even used to really celebrate the work that I did. I mean, even with the people that I love, because I felt like I had to minimize it. You're showing off for you. And I just, some days I just wanted to scream from the rooftops of if I'd landed a job or I'd got something that I'd worked hard to get or I, I wanted and, I was so proud of myself. And then I was like, oh, I better not be too great, too gloating, so to speak, when actually I just wanted to celebrate my achievement. Um, so there was a balance. But um, but going back to, you know, Hull Raisers and the character of Rana and, and the fact that you worked so intensely with Lucy and um, the writing team, because you were actually allowed to really have a say with the, those characters as well, weren't you? Yeah, I mean, they allowed us to own the character of who mm-hmm. we were, which is super helpful and um, rewarding, I suppose. But we had a lot of rehearsals and stuff. I mean, we were, yeah, we were reading it and rehearsing it well before we went into production. So you have a sense of ownership over, I mean, I would hope most characters, but in particular this one, because we had such a long rehearsal period. Um and you'd be things, you know, once you start, once I started to really figure out who she was, there'd be some, there'd be like the odd line or something where like, I actually don't know if that would come out of her mouth. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's something she, how she would reha- react. And so we would kind of chop and, you know, um, carve out who she was t- together, which is really, really, um, really revolting. And, um, you know, you have worked with some incredible writers and incredible Mm. female Mm -hmm. strong females um you know including one of our lovely late friends Kay Mella um and just so many strong incredible women and you yourself you're actually writing your your first film so you know tell me a little bit more about that and and the things maybe that you've taken from those women and putting into your own work yeah so my um I'm writing a movie and I've been actually been writing this it's been in my head since I was about 18 and um, it kind of follows on from a dissertation that I did at drama school, actually. But, um, it's a, you know, very loose semi-autobiographical story of a young girl finding her way in the world and what home means for her and how we embody home. You know, it doesn't have mm. to be the house that you were born in. It could be wherever that space is. It could be internally. And it's we follow on her on this journey as a... a at, you know coming of age drama with her finding her her sense of belonging in the world and and her sense of home and and how far along are you like with it now because I, I believe well, my first deadline's <laughs> looming <laughs> <laughs> so go on so tell me a bit more yes yeah, so, oh, well yeah I'm, I mean I'm my first draft due in in a couple of weeks actually I've got a creative <laughs> meeting after this so yeah but I'm working with phenomenal people I'm working with BFI and Fable and Hinterland and my own film company Paradise Films and um, I just have these incredible women alongside me supporting me and believing in me and holding my hand and and just it's so lovely and so reassuring and a labour of love because writing <laughs> I love it and I hate it and it acting for me just feels comes to me so much easier as a skill as opposed to writing but I think it's because it's it's quite a personal you know there's so much personal elements of me in this story and um and that's probably why I'm finding it maybe slightly more difficult but I hope to the high heavens that the next few films uh are a lot easier to write I don't know if it gets any easier I, you know, there's a discipline though, isn't it? It's this kind of, if it's not the first thing that you, you go for or that, that comes to you, you have to acquire a discipline and particularly with writing, you know, you talk about writer's block and as you said then, how much of yourself you put into it. But having, I expect having the, um, the, the reassurance and the belief of those other women around you must be such a fantastic feeling. It absolutely is. For me, a lot of it is the practical side of things of actually just sitting down and writing. I am a very, very active person and I like to be on the go. It's just, I can't sit down for too long and just be still. My meditation is for that. And then that's it. I want to be out and about. And so the actual physical act of sitting down for that many hours in the day to write, I just, that's what I find the hardest thing to do <laughs> and also like I just have so many ideas 
all at once sometimes that I want to write them all down and I feel like my hands won't move quick enough <laughs> to the pace of my thoughts and then all I've written is a line <laughs> one line and I'm just yeah so it's I'm still learning <laughs> But that's so exciting though it's so exciting and so fantastic yeah, like you know too. like we were saying you've got you've got that support you're on the way and you want to continue down that road and kind of make more of your own work because I think there's such power in your own work as well isn't there yeah I mean I'm like I'm not going to star in this movie and I already am started my next film um with a co-writer a good friend of mine and I'm not in that film I haven't written it. I need to write a part for myself at some point but I just really enjoy when I'm on set I'm obviously you know, I'm that character and I'm on screen, but there's this other side of it. I love looking at other people and think, oh, I want to write something for you. Or there's so many stories for other people that I want to write. And I find so much fulfillment in that. So in this second film uh, in particular, I'm hoping, you know, one of my best friends will, she's co-writing it with me. She'll be the lead in the movie. And I have no kind of, I need to be the lead in this film. I just look at her and think, oh, great. I can't wait to write this with you, for you. And make and as you just said, then make him work for other people as well, you know, make him work because it's difficult in our line of work, you know, to, to get the roles and stuff. And, you know, you, it's just it can be soul destroying at times. So to actually go away and make your own where you're you're in charge of it and you get to have that steer and you get to have kind of that, um, you know, that that direction with it. It's really empowering. Yeah, I mean, there's just always these stories and things going on in my head and I love putting it to paper and I love thinking oh someone's going to bring that to life um and I think I can kind of take a step back from it yeah a bit easier and, and be a bit more objective with it when I'm writing for writing for someone else um but obviously I do I would love to write my own role as well but um I it was my second film was supposed to be for myself and I haven't I'm, 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 writing, an, I'm writing a second movie which is for else, but you can do that I'll, I'll sit back on this one and you at can do that point, at some point I'll write, a, I'll write a story for me and you know I, I've we've talked before about the fact that you you really um you like Abraham Hicks and you love her work him. and you know tell me a little bit more like why what why, why you gravitate towards her work and what what how it helps you so tricky. I mean, I feel like when I first started listening to her for the first year, I just couldn't understand what she was saying, but I stuck with it. I was always drawn back to her teachings and I feel like she gave, I learned from it to be responsible for, for my life mm -hmm. and to take control of my life and to consciously create my own life as opposed to constantly letting things just happen to me, which, you you know, always let things flow anyway and let the universe kind of take, you know, charge. But in a way that I just it took me out of a victim mindset as well um, and alleviated a lot of kind of like low moods because it taught me about energy and creating from you know a good energy and, and stuff like that and that's how I then started going into meditation and just taking care of my inner being um and it just I feel so much more fearless in life I don't feel like my life is out of control I feel like even if there's some things you know that on paper feel like they're going wrong mm. I just it gives me a moment to pause and think no that's the thing that was supposed to happen it's okay I might just not see why at the moment and um and just having that perspective on life I don't know I just find it so freeing but so many people like you said then do get wrapped up and do feel like um they have to be in control of, of absolutely everything but not in a sense of what you've just said like if things are going out of control you can still have an element of this is supposed to be you know you can kind of accept it you can move forward you can create a new direction um, and I think there is something as you said quite um empowering and fearless about the, those that kind of line of thinking so that you can trust the universe a bit more and you can trust yeah. the process well trust is the is the word of the day yeah <laughs> and it's just trusting it's just it feels like it's out of control and oh my god you know and then I just think no it's not it's this thing that's just and having some element of personal control of staying in alignment in amongst chaos because life can be chaotic as we've all seen and and we've all lived and it's just staying steady through that and knowing all right it's all right let go just trust the outcome is 
the outcome that's supposed to be. It's easier said than done, and I still struggle with it. Mm. But nowhere near as much as I used to, um, where I would just dwell on things for ages and now I just let myself feel what I need to feel for a few days I really feel it fully and then it just dissipates the need to control or that should have gone this way and I just let it go not always (laughs) I'm getting better better. I was thinking oh you're better than me (laughs) well I don't know I'm still just constant practice isn't it just constant learning (laughs) well my love it has been absolutely fantastic to chat to you today you've been so so brilliant um we can catch you appearing um as bobby cratchit in a christmas carol on sky which will be out later in the year and also currently as linda in memory which is now streaming on amazon if you'd like to keep up with taj on instagram then you can follow her at taj atwell for more fashion well-being and beauty you can visit us at our website www.thecapsule.co UK where you can also catch up with our previous podcast episodes by visiting the In Conversation page and subscribing to any of our podcast channels and YouTube. We're in a brand new series so please do leave those rates and reviews and also don't forget that you can drop us a direct message at our Instagram at Official Capsule. I will be back next week with another excellent and very special guest but all that's left for us to say today is goodbye so it's goodbye from Taj Bye. and goodbye from me. This episode of the Capsule in Conversation was brought to you by Harrogate Spring Water. Bottled at source, Harrogate Spring offers a pure, refreshing taste with a delicate blend of naturally occurring minerals and electrolytes, perfect for healthy hydration.